Let me welcome all of you to the service today, especially our guests and visitors. We're delighted to have you with us as we worship God together. Let me call the attention of all of you to the worship register. There's one in each uh, row. Please, the one sitting closest to it, take it, sign it, pass it down, let others on your row sign. And while you're doing that, I'll call your attention to some of the announcements. First off, we're going to have a coffee hour, probably won't be an hour, but a little party, <laughs> after the service down in Beery Hall. So everyone is invited to come and uh, spend a few minutes greeting each other there. Uh, let me also remind the men of the men's Bible study on Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock, and then the session meets Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Uh, Wednesday, the movie Polycarp uh, will be shown, and that's, uh, what time is that? At 7 o'clock, and that was a very interesting uh, movie about one of the mar first martyrs in the church. Um, and please take notice of the information about the book nook. Um, it's a group, a discussion group. They're going to be reading Encounters with Jesus by uh, Tim Keller. It's a very challenging book, interesting book, and I'm sure you would enjoy it. So um, you can sign up down the, at the uh, in a concierge desk, and everyone is invited to do that and prepare to participate in that time together. And finally... Next week is Pentecost. What color do you wear on Pentecost? Red. Red, right. Thank you. So we'll be ready to celebrate Pentecost next week. And now from the psalmist. Be joyful in the Lord. All the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. And come before God's presence with a song. Our hymn is, O oh, Worship the King.
Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come and worship and serve you. We give you thanks that you call us. You call us together. You call us your own. You call us your family. And as we gather here, we pray that you would speak to us, convict us, convince us, and control us as we gather to worship and serve you. You know our deepest needs, and we pray that as we gather here, you will speak to them, bring us together, lift us as we lift up your holy name. We give you thanks for your grace and love toward, to us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, praying the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, choir. I know hopefully someday you'll get the pleasure I have of hearing the choir sing at you when they get in when they get into the the uh, choir loft. What an opportunity we have to open our hearts to God as He hears our needs and He speaks to us. Please join me in prayer. O oh Lord our God, being so aware of your love, we come into your presence boldly. We come from cares and concerns about our world. And we pray for your interference in this world. Turn us, we pray, from our selfish plans, our stubborn privileges, from our heavy greed and awkward pride. And we seek your help. Help for those in this church, in our family, in our friends who are dealing with sickness, with pain, with fear of the unknown. And we ask for help for those that come to mind, to our own minds now. We seek comfort for the bereaved, a lifting of weight of those who are concerned about their family and their future. No, Lord, we live in a warring world. It's heavy for us that, that nations are divided that politicians are ugly, that people are divided, divided over politics, over race, over religion. We pray for your love to take over. Take over and reign in our hearts. And our Father, we pray for ourselves. Make us aware of the power we have in us to bring a better life for others, for our neighbors and our family members. Give us a love that gives us wings to move in this world in ways that bring life and hope and love, your love, to the unlovely and all the needy. We commit ourselves afresh to you this day. Take us, use us, and anoint us with your spirit, the spirit of life. We pray in that name that is above every name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
scripture this morning is from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are set on you the pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob, Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor upon your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk his blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Amen. The word of the Lord. 
Let us pray. Speak, Lord, through your still small voice, that the ears of our heart shall be open and receptive to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. This 84th Psalm was written a long time ago, and we really don't know who wrote it, but it was a man, a person, assuming a man in those days, who made a statement that has stuck with us throughout the ages. He said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God rather than stay in the tents of the wicked. Now he was speaking from his heart, and as he spoke, he was reminding his hearers and himself of the quality of life that's found in serving God. He wasn't just talking about evil and wickedness when he said he did not want to grow in the house of the wicked or the tents of the wicked. But what he was saying really is that he would rather be a person of mundane, humble service in the church of God rather than have a place in prominence. The wickedness he's talking about is the secular. What he was saying is more important to live under the, with the understanding and with a relationship with God than to be in a place of prominence where people recognize and glorify you. It's more important to serve God than to serve our own needs and humanity. Now, when he wrote this, we're not sure when or what, but we know that he was un came to the understanding of how necessary it is to have that relationship with God that carries us through life. When I was in seminary, I heard Dr. Vernon Broyles, who was a preacher at North Avenue Presbyterian Church, preach on this, this psalm, and it stuck with me all those years. Whew, it's a lot of years. <laughs> I was ordained in 1961, and interesting that the church grew every year. It was increasing in membership in history. Church has grown in, in the United States until 1961. And that's when it started in its decline. Now, I don't know if that's any relationship to the fact that that's when I began my ministry or not, but <laughs> it's kind of scary. But the important is, is that God calls us to serve him and he reminds us, though the psalmist is reminding us of the importance of having that connection with God and walking with God in that, in that understanding. The church has, is not the same as it was back then, and it's lost a lot. But I'm not sure that's bad. The church is losing in our continent, in North America, but... In Africa and in South America and in parts of Asia, the church is really growing. One leader describes it. He said, the Holy Spirit is out of control in, in building the church in those other places. But I'm not sure it's bad that we're losing because God never intended the church to be uh, dominant over other parts of society. Like the early church, they struggled and they grew, and they grew spiritually. They grew in their relationship with God. And that's what's crucial. Not that we are big and important, but that we are close to God. And we live our lives with the understanding that God walks with us. And the writer of the psalm was reminding us of how crucial it is. The church has no equal. The church is that physical understanding, not the building, not the plant, but you and I as the people of God, when we gather to celebrate what God is doing and what he's calling us to do and 
calling us to be. The church is the body of Christ where that connection is made with God. It carries us forward. And it, we take on the eternal reference when we come to the understanding of who we are in God's sight. Our lives take on that eternal reference. When we understand at worship, when we gather and worship, something happens. Our, our priorities are reset. Our understanding of who we are and what we are is put in proper perspective, and we reorient our lives to the understanding of God. A man in New England was riding down the road and going to Boston, and he lost his bearings, and he stopped, and he said, how, ask a young boy, he said, how far is it to Boston? He said, 25,000 miles the way you're going. If you turn around, it's 16 miles. We need to turn. God calls us to turn around. When we are away from him, and to come and worship and reorient our lives in that understanding. Our lives are put in the eternal reference, in that connection. And sin is, is un, with the understanding of sin is put in that eternal reference. When we understand God's grace, it's, that sin is that which has separated us from God in that broken relationship. But God loves us and he calls us to come to him. And when we do, we make that commitment and he forgives our sins and he washes us and he calls us his own and he sends us out worshiping and serving him in ways that we take on that eternal reference by the way we live. We're alienated from God until we come to him and let him bury those sins in our past. It makes us new. He offers us that, with that understanding of who we are. And sometimes we don't understand it. We struggle with trying to comprehend the grace of God. We're like a write up in a newsletter, a church newsletter, somebody wrote about a retreat, said we had a big retreat last week and eight people made a confession of faith and everybody else had a good time. <laughs> Sometimes we tend to divide those two, don't we? And when we really understand it. Tillich, Paul Tillich, the theologian, said that that alienation with sin happens in three areas. First, we're alienated from God, we're alienated from each other, and we're alienated from ourselves, our real selves, until we let God deal with that and brings us back to him. The psalmist here in verse 5 said, Happy are those whose strength is in you and whose hearts are highways to Zion. Zion representing the fullness of love and life in God as he promises us. Sins keep us from the understanding of God and bury us from where we are. And then our homes. Our homes take on an eternal reference. When we, through the relationship we have with God, it changes our, our relationship with others and love becomes real and our the fullness of our understanding with each other grows and love blossoms when God is there. Marriage and family today has taken on a different look and oftentimes it's, it's just a civic and economic arrangement. But God calls us to have something that's deep and real and we find that when we participate in the eternal reference that God gives us in him. And then our work. Our work takes on that eternal reference. When we I realize the quality of what work is, that it's something we offer to God, 
We've lost that Protestant <laughs> ethic of work being the, on the altar of God and what it means to work and serve him. We've turned it into just doing deeds for money, and money is the poorest pay there is. We lose something in life when we don't have that connection with God. The psalmist recognized that in verse 11. He said, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield, and he bestows favor and honor. As we gather to worship, we have fellowship and we pray, and we see that work takes on a new sign. We go out in serving him. Minotti, the Italian composer, said, Hell begins on the day when God grants us the ability to look at our lives, what could have been, and he gives us a clear vision of all that we might have done. He said, Hell starts with two words. It's too late. His point was we need to under, come to the understanding that work is something holy in the sight of God. We need to look for God at work around us and come to the understanding that, that's there. Tony Campolo is one of my favorite writers and speakers. He's an Italian. He was a professor at Eastern College in Pennsylvania. And in his Italian uh, enthusiasm and excitement. He's a great speaker. He tells about going to a church in a, uh, a fairly rural area to speak. And he said, before he spoke, some guy got up and prayed. It was the morning prayer. And he prayed, dear God, I want you to take care of Charles Stolfus. He lives down the road a mile in that silver trailer. He said, he's planning on leaving his wife and family. I want you to take care of him. He lives down the road about a mile in that silver trailer. And Campolo said, knock it off, fella. You think God wants to know his address that bad? You keep mentioning it. So he said, after he spoke, he left, and he was riding down the highway and saw a hitchhiker. And so he stopped and picked him up. And he said, my name's Tony Campolo. What's yours? He says, I'm Charlie Stolfus. And he said, uh, Campolo said it was really shocking, that, but he knew what God was doing. So he said, at the next intersection, he turned right, and the guy said, hey, where are you taking me? He said, I'm taking you home. So he took him back, and he spent the rest of that day there with a man and his wife. And he said they both made a profession of, of faith. And he said the guy, that hitchhiker, is now a preacher. And he said, understanding the way God works, we see how he calls us. And that's what it means to live in that eternal reference with God. When we look for God working in our lives and see things that happen, that God is doing his will. And then we know that the eternal reference gives us an understanding of the future. The future takes on that eternal reference. There was an article in a, in a church in rural Kentucky that said the funeral of John Brown will be tomorrow at 3, a. 3 p.m. And for the first time in many years, John Brown will be here in person. Now, that was a brave preacher, or maybe church secretary, I'm not sure which. But it says a lot of truth about us. Our future is in God's hand. And church brings us to the understanding of what that future is. The church, you know, is the only organization that when we don't lose members by death because God gives us that promise of eternity. There's a cute story that's told in, by Joy Carol Wallace. There's a sitcom on British TV called The Vicar of Dibley, and it's about one of the first women vicars of the Church of England. And it tells the life of this Joy Wallace. 
And she tells about her church in Brixton, London, where the 87-year-old lady by the name of Flory, Flory Shore was her name. She said uh, she was a very godly lady. She was 87 years old, and she was a saint. She went to have surgery, and they told her that the chances of her making it through were very slim. They didn't think she would make it, but she had to have the surgery. So she uh, went through the surgery, and fortunately she came through it alive. And as she was waking up, she looked in the face of, of her doctor, who was there, in a, and it was still a fuzzy picture her eyes were seeing, and he was in a white coat. And she says, hello, God. I, I'm Flory Shore. And uh, the bishop, or the vicar, said, you know, that says a lot about her. Number one is she's humble enough to think God really didn't know who she was. She was introducing herself. She said, but the other thing was that she realized that she, she, her faith led her to know that she would immediately be in the presence of God when she died. That's the kind of faith that God calls us to have as we walk the path of life around us day by day. The resurrection is the cornerstone of the life God promises us. From Easter, we know the fullness of that. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, he said, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead now lives in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the power that God gives us. Finally, the promise of the eternal reference comes to us when it becomes real, when we live in a world like today, when there's so much turmoil and so many crises and so many things that go wrong and there's so much suffering and there's so much division and hate. We understand the fullness of God's message, that God brings a peace to his people. And in the, the eternal reference, we understand what the peace that God gives us. Our God reigns, and his church is forever. And we can realize that as we participate and grow in God. Randy reminded me this last Thursday was uh, Ascension Day when Christ, we honor the day that Christ ascended into heaven. And remember his words. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. And lo, I am with you all the days. The presence of Christ in our lives. And we become aware of his spirit in us. We're changed. Things around us are changed. We have to be faithful in a new way to give witness to what we bear, the goodness and the love of Christ. You have the eternal reference. and You are God's messengers to a lost world. Be who you are. Be who you are. Amen. Our hymn is How Lovely Lord.
now go into God's world and know that God goes before you. And wherever you find yourselves, you're there by God's appointment. Not by accident, but in the providence of God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.